Kostas Zigalakis. I'm a lecturer in the mathematics of data science at the University of Edinburgh and also uh, a faculty fellow here at the Turing Institute. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, ergodic stochastic differential equations and sampling and going to talk to you about the numerical analysis perspective. So I, I realize that might be a lot of different words on the on the slide that people that are not mathematicians might might seem a bit daunting, but hopefully by the end by the end of the talk, uh, some of these things would make a bit more sense, and its connection with data science perhaps would be would become more apparent. Uh, before I actually start talking about the different things uh, that I'm going to talk today, I just wanted to sort of give you a brief introduction of how I got interested in, into data science and to problems relating with sampling and computational statistics. Uh, so if you like, I have a roadmap of my research interests and how they evolved through the years. So uh, this is, if you like, my mathematical me. Uh, I was a PhD student between 2004 and 2008 at the University of Warwick, and there uh, it was sort of like my first contact with stochastic models. In particular, we're looking on uh, stochastic models of turbulent diffusion um, and analyzing stochastic differential equations both from a theoretical point of view, which was a large component of the PhD, but a large component of that was relating with computational aspects of how do you solve a stochastic differential equation. And that naturally kind of led to one of my main research interests, uh, which is the numerical analysis of stochastic differential equations, um, which is something that I'm st still actively involved in until today, but in some sense, and that's kind of the central dogma of my research, and also the central dogma of the, of the talk that, I'm, that, I'm, that, I'm, that I will give today is that there are a lot of nice connections between applied mathematics, numerical analysis, computational statistics, and machine learning. Uh, so after reading more things about numerical analysis of SDEs, I got, and in general about stochastic models and computational statistics, I got interested in computational statistics, and actually in 2015, we complete a book on uh, the mathematics of data simulation with Andrew Stewart and Cody Lowe. And more recently, uh, and that also resonates well with my um, fellowship here at the Turing Institute, um, I'm getting interested in trying to quantify uncertainty in the presence of data. I'm going to come back to this nice figure at the end of my talk and try to explain a bit what we're seeing here. But if you like, here is kind of the roadmap of how I got uh, interested in data science and uh, computational statistics. And in some sense, all these things might seem a bit far-fetched, like starting from you know, mo modeling what happens in p for particles in the ocean to wanting to analyze a, a real data science problems. But what I will try to argue for the next 20 minutes is that actually, in some sense, there, is a se there, there are some similarities between all these problems. And actually, this is what mathematicians likely, usually like to do. They want to, they want to find an underlying principle that carries over through different disciplines. Um, so the mathematical problem, which is in some sense um, most common along, along these different disciplines, is this very simple integration problem. Um, Really what you want to do, at least in specific cases, even, even, even in data science, you are interested in calculating this integral. So you're given a function f, a probability density pi of x, and what you want to do is to calculate an expectation with respect to that. Uh, and that probability density might be arising from molecular dynamics, okay? So you want to calculate some th thermodynamic limits with respect to the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution. Um, in the, in the most typical case of Bayesian inference, uh, you know, you can think of pi of x as being your posterior distribution. You have some prior on your data, you observe some data, and then you just want to infer uh, what is the posterior distribution. Uh, I mean, what I have here in the parentheses, it's true that sometimes even defining what the correct statistical framework is, is tricky. And that on its own, it's a very interesting problem, which I'm not going to touch today. Uh, and also, integrals of this kind appear uh, in data simulation problems. So. Again, I mean, in some sense, this problem looks deceptively easy. Yeah? This is just something that you learn in Calculus 101, how to integrate. So why are we here today? I mean, there are a few difficulties associated, possible difficulties associated with calculating this integral. Uh, one of them might, is that x might be high dimensional. So you know, if you think about a model that has million of parameters, for example, you know, the dimension of x could be a million. Uh, so, in principle, standard quadrature methods would not work to calculate this integral. Another thing is that 
pi might, might be known only up to normalization, normalization constant, uh, and this is mo the, the case that you're most, most of the time in computational statistics. Other, other problems is, uh, another, another typical problem could be that um, pi of x might be concentrated along a specific manifold on your space, which in, in, on, on, the, on the language of random variables is translated with the underlying uh, random variables exhibiting strong correlations. Um, and something that is actually particularly important in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the era of big data, if you're sort of trying to solve a Bayesian problem in the, in the presence of a lot of data, just evaluating this, this, uh, this probability density might be very expensive. Uh, so these are just some different challenges uh, of, of why this could be a difficult thing to do. But what I'm gonna argue today, so on the first, on, the, on, on this slide, I identify what I believe to be a common feature along, along, the, along these, these different problems. In my next slide, I'm gonna talk about a, pos a, pos a possible computational device in order to be able to calculate expectations like this. So I have already used the word stochastic differential equations about five times and have not really told you what a stochastic differential equation is. So here is an example of a stochastic differential equation. You can think of it as a normal ordinary differential equation, but it's also some subject to some randomness. And the point is, in some sense, if, even if you don't know anything about SDs, you can think of this as a, as a computational device. And, and, and I, I say that in the following sense. Um, basically, if your probability density is satisfying specific conditions, you can prove that the solutions of, of this SD are ergodic with respect to pi of x. And again, this, if you're not from, from this area, you might don't, not know what it means. Uh, in, the, in the context of talking about a possible computational device, this is really what I mean. The theory tells you that if you take a long trajectory out of this stochastic differential equation and you integrate it, you have that the time average will converge to a spatial average. So this is what I mean by saying that this is a possible computational device. I'm going to put two big ifs on the table. Uh, the first if being assuming that we could solve this stochastic differential equation exactly. That's the first if. And the second if is, and if you could do that, assuming that you could actually simulate for time t equals infinity, then you would basically, by using this estimator, you would obtain uh, the quantity of interest, okay? Um, so, and here in this slide, it's just, it's just, in this figure, is just a manifestation of what, of, what this limit, of what this limit means. But in some sense, I have, I have already used two big ifs, yeah? If you could solve this exactly, I mean, in practice, you cannot solve this exactly, uh, as is the case with ordinary differential equations. There are only very few ordinary differential equations you can, you, for which you have a closed form solution. And the second bit is if you could integrate up to time t infinity. So these are the two issues that we, that we need to consider. And in practice, we cannot solve our equation exactly, so we have to simulate it. And also, we cannot simulate it up to time t infinity. Um, so each, each of these two limitations is introducing two di to a, sor a source of error. The first source of error, which associated with the numerical discretization of the SDE, I will call it asymptotic bias. And the second sort of error, which has to do with the fact that you can actually cannot calculate things taking your time integration time to infinity, I will call that asymptotic variance. And again, for people that they are more mathematically oriented, uh, this is basically, if you like, the quantity that you are interested in making small as your integ integration time becomes large, and this is actually the sum of the asymptotic by the, the sum of the square of the asymptotic bias plus the asymptotic variance divided by your time of integration. But in some sense, if you don't if you don't want to worry too much about mathematics, given that we have these two limitations, each of those two limitations is introducing another source of error. Um, so this is really what. The, the, the talk is going to be about. Um, so in some sense, going back to the first point of one having to discretize a stochastic differential equation, I will present basically two approaches. The first approach is, is prominent in the numerical analysis community. The second approach is prominent in the computational statistics community. So in the first case, you just discretize your SD with the, your simplest possible numerical scheme and you just integrate for a long time and you hope for the best. Um, in the second case, which is the computational statistics case, I mean, I'm not gonna go into too much, 
too much details, but basically you propose a move to your next state according to probability distribution, and then you accept or reject that move with an underlying probability, okay? So, but from the point of view of this talk, you can, you can think of this as being like, this, if you like, the simplest approach, the numerical analysis approach, and this is kind of slightly more complicated. Um, so the things to consider when making a choice are the following one. In the first approach, in the numerical analysis, um, actually, even if you could take the limit of t going to infinity, the corresponding probability measure that you would obtain from this averaging would not be equal to the true one. So even if you could integrate for time t equals to infinity, you would still have asymptotic, as an asymptotic bias. On the other hand, this is not true in the case of computational statistics. If you use these metropolis hastings types of algorithm, you can actually prove, and it's quite a simple proof, that if you calculate, if you take your time t going to infinity, um, then the thing that you estimate from your, from, your, from your numerical discretization is actually equal to the probability density that you, that you want to sample from. Uh, but there are two buts here. The first but is that in the presence of big data, the standard computational statistics approach might be expensive. I'm not really going to talk about this too much today. But what I really want to focus on, and this is the research part of this talk, because so far we have been talking about some basic stuff in there. Uh, in connecting numerical analysis of SDs and computational statistics, is that by using the first approach, we can construct non-reversible algorithms that have some very favorable properties. Uh, and this is basically what I'm going to focus in the rest of my talk. Um, so again, there are a, a lot of words here that might not mean a lot to people in the audience. But hopefully, um, as I'm going through the next slide, we're going to see what are the practical implications for real sampling problems of the fact that the numerical analysis allows you to, con to construct non-reversible algorithms. So, so the, this, this, part of the, 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 this part of work is actually joint work with Andrew Duncan from University of Sussex and Greg Paviotis from, uh, from Imperial College. Uh, and it's really, the way I see it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question in the, in the numerical analysis of SDEs, but actually, as you will see, it has real implications on the field of computational statistics and data science. Um, so I'm going to concentrate in the case of uh, irreversible diffusion. So now I'm writing down a stochastic differential equation. You have seen this part before, and you have seen this part before, but now there is this thing which I will call a non-reversible perturbation. Okay? If I was to take beta equals to zero, this is exactly the same stochastic differential equation I was writing before as a computational device. Um, so. The interesting thing about this SDE is that this is kind of a generalization of the previous thing that I talk about, in the sense that for every beta, this SDE is still ergodic with pi. So you could think of this as a generalized computational device that helps you calculate your, your, your expectations. Um, the interesting thing is that for any value of beta different than zero, the corresponding SDE has a very good property. And that good property being is that it has small asymptotic variance. In other words, what I'm writing here, if you take the value beta equals to zero, the corresponding asymptotic variance of the underlying SDE is going to be the largest possible, which is actually bad, I will argue, in terms of, in terms of doing sampling. So the question that we, we have addressed in this, in, in this paper and it's really a numerical analysis question, but I, as I will show you, it has implications for, for real uh, data science uh, problems, is how to discretize the dynamics in the case of beta greater than zero in such a way that the good property of small asymptotic variance of the original equation is maintained. Okay, so I have in, I'm saying that this is a numerical analysis question because in a sense, I have an SD, I know that it has a specific property, I want to put it into my computer in such a way that the, the discretization of that respects the good properties of the SD. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm just going to present basically the numerical scheme, which is what we call in the numerical analysis the splitting scheme. You break your original SD into two parts, the first being the non-reversible part, which is deterministic, and the second one being actually the SD that I talked to you uh, uh, before about. And you, you, and you base your algorithm on this splitting. So you solve this, this equation with a deterministic integrator for one step, then you take this as an initial condition to this, to, this, to this equation which you solve with a metropolized integrator for the same, for the same time. 
Um, so this is what is called a splitting method. Uh, I mean, again, in some sense, if you're not familiar with numerical analysis, this is a way to solve the stochastic differential equation, okay? But the important thing is what are the implications of that? Um, the fact that you're doing the splitting, okay, implies that your method is not gonna be unbiased. So we go back to the numerical analysis approach where the probability measure, the probability that we eventually end up in the limit of t going to infinity is not the one that we're interested in. But the, but the thing is that you can control that asymptotic bias uh, by the choice of the non-reversible integrator. So in some sense, if you choose a very accurate integrator for this deterministic ODE, then your asymptotic bias will be negligible, at least in specific cases, and this is what I'm gonna show you. On the other hand, for the asymptotic variance, you can prove that it's gonna be a, a very small perturbation of the true asymptotic variance. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you have managed to write down a discretization that respects the good properties of the original SD. And this was actually kind of the question that we were trying to answer. So here is where the numerical analysis will stop and where we gonna, I'm gonna show you a few pictures that hopefully explain why actually having an integrator that has these properties is a good thing. So on the level of simple trajectories, uh, here I have the case of a, of a very strongly correlated uh, co concentrate distribution. So I, ha I have a two-dimensional distribution, which as you can see, basically most of the probability mass is, 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 is concentrated on a weird manifold, okay? Uh, and what you see here, hopefully with the, with the, gray, with the gray circles, with the gray circles, is basically uh, so how your solution is behaving if you solve the equation for beta equals zero, so you, you, ha you are in the reversible case, and then with red dots, you see what is happening if you solve your equation for the same amount of time, but with the scheme that I talked to you about. And as you can see, uh, hopefully, hopefully that's convincing, you can see that your, uh, your non-reversible scheme has actually traveled quite far away uh, in, 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 the, in the space where there's quite a lot of probability mass. So this, if you like, is a little cartoon, uh, that you want that might help you understand why using this more general SD could be a good thing. Um, so continuing with cartoons before I show you the one, one real application, um, I'm studying the case where I just have a Gaussian distribution in two dimensions. Again, this is, this is fairly simple. And here what I'm doing is I'm studying how the mean square error, that was the quantity I wrote before in my slide, is changing as a function of time. In principle, with a with black line, you see how the, the, an exact method, how the exact solution of the SD is behaving when beta equals to zero. So you go down like one over, like one over T. And what you can see is that once you take, you take the values of beta greater than zero, there is, a, there is a, a range of times for which your mean square error is always smaller than the mean square error of the of, 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 of the of the of the case beta equals zero, so you can see that you always start below. But for example, for beta equals twenty five, as you increase the time, the bias is dominating, so you are not seeing the effect of the asymptotic variance. The same applies for beta equals to zero, and in some sense, uh, when it comes to beta equals five and one, you are still at the domain where the fact that you have reduced asymptotic variance gives you a benefit. So you could, have, you could have stopped me here and basically ask, okay, but in some sense, this dotted line is always going to win using, a, using, a, using, a, using the reversible SD, the SD with beta equals zero, as you're gonna take time t equals infinity, because it's unbiased, but when you use a metropolized integrator, um, it would always win what all the method that, that I have been uh, showing you. But the point is that if you think about realistic examples, okay, big examples where calculating pi might be expensive, you cannot afford such a long integration time. You cannot really afford coming all the way down here and see the benefits of the, the, see the, benefits of the metropolized integrator. Uh, so you might be able just to, just to afford computation time up to here, and there you really would like to use the benefits of the, of, of, of the non-reversible scheme. In some sense, again, a criticism is 
that you know that this is not a big difference here, but this is just because this is a toy example. But this kind of caricature uh, propagates in more complicated examples, and this is the example that I'm going to show you, show, show you in just a sec. In particular, um, here we're trying to fit a, a model that describes the location, the location, the location of trees in space. So these are actually actual data from location of from the location of some trees in Finland, and what the underlying statistical model tells you, uh, it's, a, it's a Gaussian log Cox uh, model, is that the tree positions are modeled as a special Poisson process with intensity lambda ij, so that's the intensity, the Poisson intensity at the ij site of your domain, okay, which itself, it's equal to exponential of y ij, where y is itself a Gaussian distribution. So if you have not seen this model before, it's just a standard statistical special model. You don't have to worry about that. In, in, the, in the context of what I've, I've been describing, doing the whole Bayesian analysis on this one, it's basically giving you this posterior distribution that you have to sample from. So this is the object that I have to put into my SDE and try, get, and try to get samples from. Um, so I'm actually really excited about these pictures because I think they show, uh, even to a non-expert, that kind of using the, the splitting scheme is better than using, uh, using a metropolized scheme when beta equals zero. So I'm not sure how, how, how well you can see, but I mean, this, this kind of picture look, look much more converged than this picture on the left. And this, the, both of the pictures are pictures of the average inferred Poisson intensity with the one scheme and the other scheme, okay? Uh, and for exactly the same computational cost. So at least on the level, of, on the level of, 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 of pictures, if somebody was to ask you which, in which of the two do you think the algorithm has, has converged better, you would probably say this one. Uh, or I hope you would say this one. Uh, this is further manifested in this picture here, where I'm just estimating uh, the expectation of y, uh, y11, okay, when I'm using my Mala scheme and when I'm using my metropolized schemes, ma my uh, non-reversible schemes for the same computational cost. And as you can see, the prediction that comes from, this, from these two methods is completely different. You can ask, okay, so Costas, what is the correct one? In this case, we're able to run, and this was already in the limits of our computational power, we're able to run a reference path, okay, which was a thousand times more computational expensive uh, than, than, than the path that we have used here. And as, so you can think of it as this being the truth. So you see that for much less computational cost, we're able to get the correct answer with a range of, with a, with a combination of parameters. Um, so if I am to conclude, I hope that I convince you that understanding the long time properties of numerical integrations has important implications for applications that using numerical analysis gives you a systematic way of analyzing the different errors that they appear in your calculations. Uh, and once you have that knowledge, you can try to balance the, the bias and the variance and create uh, numerical schemes that achieve much better inference results on challenging problems. Uh, so in the last uh, minute or so of my talk, I just want to say about a few other things that uh, I'm involved here at the Turing Institute or uh, um, with collaborators both from the Turing Institute and outside the Turing Institute. One of the problems that I'm really excited about is this one here. So I, I think I have about one or two minutes. So I'll just try to describe what you see here. So the standard problem in machine learning uh, is basically you try to classify an object. It's, it, is it a type, is it type N A object or a type B object? So in particular, for people that are experts in machine learning, they must have seen this data set a million times, okay? So these are handwritten digits, and then you want to create an algorithm that tells you, is that a four or is that a nine, okay? One of the possible issues is that with machine learning algorithms is that most of them don't give you an estimation of the uncertainty in something being a four or something being a nine. Um, so what we are doing with joint work with Andrew Stewart from Caltech and Andrea Bertozzi and her PhD student Michael Luau from UCLA, we try to develop a Bayesian framework that allows us to characterize uncertainty uh, when it comes to classification of high dimensional data. So in particular, what you see here is the outcome of one of the algorithms that we are using. 
the bottom row, which I think you can all see and agree that you know these are fours, okay, is the row that the algorithm is the is the pictures for which the algorithm is most is most certain about this number being a four. So they have the less the, the, the least uncertainty. But what you're seeing here is the images that the algorithm has analyzed and basically has the most uncertainty about them being a four or a nine. So I think this is a this is a very exciting area, and actually being at the Turing Institute uh, where there are a lot of people working in machine learning, a lot of people working in statistics, and a lot of people working in applied mathematics is a very good thing uh, because by talking with, 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 with all these people, we can try and push things forward. Uh, and with that, with that note, I think I will finish and just thank you for your attention. Here, you mean? It would, it would depend. It would depend on pi. It would depend on how stiff or non-stiff is. But we have a rule of thumb that kind of tells us uh, it, 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 it. It's a combination of pi and it's also a combination of beta. Yeah, because in principle you would like to use beta being large in order to take advantage of the fact that the asymptotic variance is going down. But of course that might give you some problems in terms of how big you can take delta t. So I'm not claiming that there is not fine tuning going here. Uh, uh, but the, the thing is that you, c you can have a few heuristics that tells you how you choose stuff, and once you do that, you can really, I mean, I, I, I find these results really impressive. You can really, sh you can really see the benefit of, 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 of using this, uh, this thing. I mean, again, in some sense, this might be something that people in computational statistics not, nece not necessarily like, because, as I said, if you integrate for very, 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 very long time, the standard approaches would be better. But the point is that in many applications you cannot afford to integrate. So on, on this slide you have, on the x-axis, you have time which you compare. Yes. But for a larger beta, you're going to need a short time step as you can. Yes, expect. yes. So the cost might actually be, so for the same time, the cost of running with a higher beta is actually higher, right? Yes. So, so even though the for the same time the MSE is lower, the actual cost to run this algorithm might have been higher? Might be higher, you're right. But this is, this is just to illustrate the generic behavior of the algorithm and the fact that for larger, th as t improves, goes larger, you're basically going to have the, un you know, the metropolized thing winning. But in here, I mean, it, all these results that I'm showing you, there is no cheating. It's exactly the same number of, of, of gradient evaluations. So in some sense, actually, because you know, in the one case here, you're just doing MCMC and you just do, let's say, one function evaluation at every time. But in here, let's say I do a ring Yakuta four, so I do four function evaluations. So in one step of this algorithm costs five evaluations. One step of this algorithm costs one or two. I mean, it depends how you count. But I'm actually not running them for the same physical time. I just, wh what I really tune is how many how many function evaluations I do. So even with that, you can, still, you can still see the benefit. So what you see here is for precisely the same computational cost. There is no cheating. OK. Uh, so I saw you working with Mike Giles. Is this to sort of turn this into some sort of multi-level method? Yeah. So what are the different levels? Yeah, so we have, we have some work actually with, with some previous work with Mike, uh, Sebastian, and Lucas, which I didn't have time to talk about today, which basically allows you to use multi-level Monte Carlo in order to calculate. Uh, sorry, I'm flipping too many things. In order to calculate uh, this, exp this, this expectation here, the different levels there. You have two parameters. The one, the one is how big or small your time step is, but this is also tuned with how long you integrate. Because you have a double limit, you also need to take the limit of t going to infinity. So I can tell you more about that afterwards if, if you're interested. Okay. Thank you.